For Kremer Media's Polity, I'm Sane Lamini. Peter Delias joins me to discuss the book titled Right to Land. Peter, tell us how the idea of this important book started. Well, William Baynard and I and, and Michelle Hay have all been working on land issues throughout our careers, which in my and William's case is a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. So we've been talking about these issues for many years, and Michelle, who did an outstanding PhD on land issues. So we've been having a conversation for a very long time, debating what the, what the solutions are, what the problems are. And then a couple of years ago, Good Governance Association um, approached us, or approached William, with the idea that we might do something on this topic. So that kind of kick-started this exercise. Um, and then we were also involved to some extent, uh, particularly my, Michelle and myself, in the high-level panel exercise in, in providing information, research information going into that. So that also helped the process along. Our country has a huge problem when it comes to land issues. Can you reflect on the historical processes that led to South Africa's racially skewed possession of land? Well, you know, we have to go back into to colonial and imperial history. And what you see in South Africa is a, is a powerful imperial colonial system which effectively dispossesses Africans of the land. Um, and it does it in a variety of ways, but there's always an element of violence in it because in, you know, it's the, the ability of that system to impose its, its desires and its systems on another system. So two things happen as a result of that. One is that you end up with a, a, the enormously unequal distribution of land that you get in South Africa. But the other is that one, you know, the, the, the ideas of the vast majority of South Africans about what rights in land are, how land should be dealt with, were ignored. Mm -hmm. And instead an external system of, of land values and land rights imposed. Mm -hmm. So what we have is a is an illegitimate system of land holding, if you like. At, mm -hmm. at one level, people don't accept the distribution of land. Mm -hmm. But at another level, they're profoundly different ideas about how land should be regarded and treated. Mm -hmm. So we have to solve that. And the Constitution has provided us with some mechanisms, but we're a long way from getting there yet. With the dawn of democracy in 1994, the government intended to redistribute 30% of land to black people by 2014. Why has this process been so slow over the years? You know, there are a number of, of, of dimensions to it. But, you know, one is the, the one part of the problem is that part of, of uh, the, the policies were around restitution. And a system of restitution was put in place, which was supposed to be quite small in practice, really dealing with some of the most grotesque elements of black spot removals in the, in the 1950s and 1960s. But that program exploded for a variety of reasons. It got bigger and bigger. But the, the institutions that were set up to deal with it, the land commissions and others, simply didn't have the capacity and they were overwhelmed and the nature of the definition expanded, and to some extent it became a synonym for, for redistribution. So a whole lot of policy objectives got combined in one thing. So that happened, and then simply with, with, uh, with land redistribution, I think a number of the models were not particularly effective, and there simply wasn't the funding in order to be able to achieve that. So we've had this funny combination of uh, very ambitious goals and then very inadequate institutional and financial structures to make land reform work. Can the government, specifically the Department of Rural Development and Land Reform, be partly blamed for this delay? Well, I think it's bigger than the Department of Land Reform and the land commissions. I think to a very considerable extent they were given this massive task and simply not resourced either with, uh, with the finances or with the skills. I mean, these de departments, these institutions, were not built from the ground up with the capacity to actually handle something like this. And then, of course, they get starved with funds. Mm -hmm. So I think within that framework, one can certainly, certainly point at fingers at, at the department in certain aspects and say, you know, there were failures, there was also the possibilities opened up for corruption, which people used. State capture is not only you know, happening in the cities and in the industries, mm -hmm. elements of the same processes have been playing out in relationship to land reform as well. Mm -hmm. So yes, the department has a responsibility, but I think uh, 
government as a whole has a the bigger responsibility and you know needs to start to rethink the ways in which it goes about this. Your book also focuses on land restitution as well as security of tenure issues. Can you briefly discuss those two terms and tell us how they can be improved? Okay, so land restitution is is the idea that people who were dispossessed of land since 1913 is the way it was set up. Uh, and in particular, initially, the idea that people who had property in land mm -hmm. uh, should be compensated for that or given the land back. And that was the initial goal. And I think it was seen as a way of opening up uh, or you know, um, legitimizing or opening up the, an area for wider land redistribution. But what happened there, I think, is classically relates to what I've just said. It was that the land restitution was not properly planned at the outset. Mm -hmm. uh, the land commissions were not properly resourced. They didn't have the they didn't have the legal capacity. They didn't have the historical capacity. They didn't often even have the most basic organisational forms, like you know filing systems and ways of maintaining the material, and they were underfunded. Uh, so. What's happened is that land restitution is really not matched up with people's expectations. And the tragedy for me is that I spent quite a lot of time traveling in the rural areas of South Africa doing research around these issues and talking to people who've made land claims. And the sad thing is that many, many, many of the people who laid claims in 1998, you know, 20 years ago, who were then elderly but you know, had years ahead of them, who hoped that they would get something out of it, who'd often suffered brutal and impoverishing processes of removal, have seen nothing. And many of them now, when you go to those villages to talk to people and you ask, they say, no, well, unfortunately, the old people, the people who knew about what happened, who lived through it, they're dead. So in the 20 years that we haven't delivered it, an awful lot of, of in many cases, impoverished South Africans have not had any, any, any compensation for, for what they suffered. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a great tragedy. With tenure, I think there's a slightly different problem here because what happens with that imperial colonial system as it develops in South Africa is that it allows two systems of land holding to develop. And that dual system of land holding is also fundamental to the apartheid order. And that is in white areas, uh, people develop private property in land. They have very, very strong land rights, mm -hmm. and that provides the basis for a modernizing, growing economy. In the rural areas of South Africa, people's land rights are seen as of a lesser order. And you have these systems of communal land tenure developing in a variety of other forms. But the thing about all of those forms is they do not have the same strength as private property does. So we have a system of strong rights for white people, to put it crudely, and weak rights for black people. And so what we're arguing for in this book is that we cannot possibly as a society go ahead on the basis of having a, an effectively apartheid system of land rights. And also what we argue very strongly is if you go back and look at pre-colonial African societies, and you look at the history and ethnographies that we have of them, all the evidence suggests that African families and African individuals had very, very strong rights to land. And in fact, those rights were equivalent to a property right and could have been developed into a property right over time, instead of which they were diminished. And rights in land were very often moved from being located at the level of the family or the individual and increasingly white officials and then subsequently and today traditional authorities mm -hmm. have claimed that they are the owners of the land. So our central argument in this book is that that needs to be reversed mm -hmm. and we need to ensure that people living in, in rural areas get strong rights to land at a, at a household and individual level. You also mention in the book that much of the agricultural land in our country is underutilized for farming. Why is that? Well, I think in, 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 the, in the reserve, the old reserve areas or, or the areas set aside by the 1913 Land Act, you know, we, we, what has happened over the 20th century is that uh, South Africa became primarily a migrant labor system. Mm 
and millions and millions of people left the rural areas for long periods of time to work in the cities. Now that's not a system that al allowed you to sustain an agricultural economy. So some agriculture continued and it, it wasn't insignificant, but in fact the vast majority of people's livelihoods came increasingly from, from working, from, from labour. And then from the 1950s onwards, you also had a situation where millions and millions of people were moved out of white areas and placed in these areas. Most of those didn't have, uh, many of those were not given land to plant or grow on. And then in the, from the 1970s onwards, you also had the mass expansion of, of black schooling in the rural areas. So many of the children were in schools. And when they left schools, they weren't particularly interested in farming. It wasn't the future they saw for themselves. So you have the destruction of a farming system through migrant labor. You have millions of people being dumped back into the area. You have a whole variety of other restrictions and disincentives. I increasingly, to farm in South Africa, you have to have money. It's a very expensive business. So if you can't invest, you can't get a return. And for poor people in the rural areas, they don't have the money to invest, and a farming culture has also been eroded. What policy do you think should be adopted with regards to land ownership in areas falling under the authority of traditional leaders? And do you think people living in such areas should get access to title deeds? I think that's one of, one of the central arguments of the book, mm -hmm. is that you know, the current tendency which we see in state, in state policy and even in draft legislation there's a good deal of confusion around these issues, but there has been a strong tendency to shift the locus of ownership towards traditional authorities. And we think that is, a, a, is in denial of, of, of history and of customary law, and that we think that we need to follow the Constitution. The Constitution uh, stated that those p individuals whose, we whose rights to land had been weakened under the apartheid and segregation system. It was incumbent upon the new state to strengthen their rights in land. So in short, I absolutely, I think we need to ensure that ordinary people living in the rural areas get rights to land, strong rights to land, and that they're not, that those lands are not removed from them and given them to traditional authorities. You have many important roles to play, but the allocation, distribution and ownership of land doesn't seem to be us to us to be something that they should play a central role in. In urban areas, what are the land reform priorities and how could apartheid spatial geography best be overcome? Look, there are huge problems because the, you know, the other thing when we think about land in South Africa, mm. sometimes the debate is very static, you know, who's got land where and what is the distribution. Now that's not insignificant. But we also need to recognize that South Africa is, is an urbanizing country, yeah. that millions of people are moving to the cities, and that we're not going to change that reality. The apartheid planners spent their, all their time trying to ensure that black people didn't move to the cities, and they failed dismally. Um, and it's, you know, nothing is going to stop that process. So we argue in the book that an absolutely central priority for long-term thinking about land is to recognize that we are an urbanizing society, that the greatest pressure on land is going to be in urban areas, that we need to unlock, find and unlock resources of land, and that we also provide people who are moving to the cities with title, so that they have title in land. Mm. And for a starter, we need to make sure that all the people in RDP houses who've not yet been issued title, and the backlog is a million or more, that that needs to happen as a matter of, of urgency. And lastly, the newly elected ANC president, Cyril Ramaphosa, has promised to return the land back to its rightful owners while he was campaigning. Do you think this was just a mere campaign promise, or maybe the ANC will actually prioritize the land issue in the years ahead? Well, let's hope so. I mean, I think, um, you know, during the campaign, um, Sir Ramaphosa gave out, and his, his team gave out somewhat contradictory uh, messages about land. Mm -hmm. um, my sense is that there, there is a commitment to overhauling the system and, and, create, and dealing with some of the issues that we've dealt with. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is also the high-level panel report uh, which has been placed before Parliament, which was chaired by Khalema Matlante, mm -hmm. 
uh, which I think sets out a fairly full set of, of ideas and policy suggestions about how we could move forward. So I would hope that, that Gilema Mortante and, and Cyril Ramaphosa have, a, have an engagement and that there's a wider engagement, both with our book and, mm -hmm. and with the High Level Panel Report, and that we do move ahead. I think it's a critical moment. Mm -hmm. We can't continue, I think, in South Africa to live in a system which is actually divided in this way between those you have and those you don't, and those you have strong rights and those you have weak rights. Mm -hmm. These are all legacies of a, of a racist and apartheid system. Mm -hmm. We need to overcome them and build a consensus. We need a consensus in South Africa, a, a system of land holding which is regarded as legitimate by the vast majority of people. And on that basis, I think we can move ahead as a society in much more positive ways. That was Peter Delias speaking to Krima Media's policy about the book titled Right to Land.